team State Champions Day in all of Hamilton County. <laughs> Um, at this time, we'll have the coach come up and uh, say a word before we present the proclamation. But I want to open it up to Vice President Driehaus uh, and Commissioner Dumas. Yeah, so the coach can, so you can word. still come forward. It's <laughs> Not off the hook, coach. Not He's off. making his way and then backed up. Um, so, yeah, congratulations to the girls, to your families, to the coaches, to the principal, to the whole school community. Uh, it's such a thrill to honor you here today. Uh, my understanding is that this first time ever girls wrestling has had uh, a championship uh, at the state level and you guys set uh, made history and won it for the first time so i know you're super excited i know you're all different levels of high school um, but sports gives you a way to participate in a really meaningful way in the school community um, and be part of a team and part of something bigger than yourself so uh, i applaud the coaches for stepping up to coach the team and girls you must have been rocking it uh, at the state championship so congratulations Thank you, Commissioner Dumas. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Chloe and Reagan, are you here? Can you just come right up here so we can see who won the, the individual titles? And turn so the cameras can get you. And 100, turn this way so the cameras will get you. Yeah. 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 For the yeah. Yeah. Great job. Thank you so much. And you would never know it. You meet them on the street. Oh, I'm going to get them. No, you're not going to get them. <laughs> So thank you so much. You can be seated. And uh, sports just do so much for our lives. Uh, as Madam President was saying, all three of us have been involved in sports. And so it just uh, brings that camaraderie together, that unity. It teaches you about life. And so I'm just so glad that you guys are involved in that. And what was mentioned earlier, you can get scholarships for this also. So thank you so much for coming. And we certainly appreciate you. Thank you. I want to also acknowledge, um, we're going to hear from Coach in a minute, uh, but we have uh, Head Coach Chad Dennis here. Uh, girls Coach Chris Bard is here. Uh, the Principal of Harrison High School is here. Joe Paulette, did I say it right? Paulette. I'm sorry. Joe Paulette is here. Thank you. Um, and then we have Eric Myers, who's Assistant Wrestling Coach. Um, just what last week or week before, we had uh, girls here for one of the basketball. It seems like women, we're cleaning the clock. I love it. Um, and I think it's important to be noted. Uh, we have some of the most talented athletes and particularly girl athletes. Uh, and this is Women's Month, and I don't think a better way to end this month than to have Harrison Girls Wrestling, who not only won the state championship, but you're going to be in the history books because it's the first one. And I just want to commend all of you, uh, two of the young ladies, I know Coach will talk about it, who will have scholarships. And one of the biggest things I'm pushing, we want more of our young people in Hamilton County to have scholarships. There's a lot of scholarships out here, and I think we've got the best talent for it. And our board being historic as the first uh, time three women have won this, uh, this election for Hamilton County and for us now to honor the first girls team to win the girls wrestling in the state of Ohio. It's just history right here. Someone's going to write about this. This is history in the making uh, right here. And so I just wanted to commend these uh, young ladies for all that you do on and off uh, the uh, wrestling uh, because it's so important what you do. We are very much investing in young people. Uh, we've got a Women and Girls Commission that uh, Vice President Driehaus uh, mentioned about being involved in. We've got a, uh, a, a program that we're getting ready to launch to have more funding for uh, these type of programs that keep our young people in positive activities. And uh, I'm pushing for a youth state-of-the-art uh, amateur youth facility, indoor and outdoor, uh, so people can come from all over the world and compete and bring the money here to Hamilton County. So we'll keep you uh, posted on those things as well. So with that, uh, Coach, I want to, I mean, I don't know what it's like I mean, to be the first and then go in here and dominate. Uh, tell us, what it, what, how was it? <laughs> well, first of all, on behalf of our school district and uh, our administrators and our coaches, thank you to the county commissioners for having us 
here today. Uh, these girls have, have put in the time and put in the work, and we're very proud of them. Uh, like you said earlier, we have two girls that will be going on wrestling scholarships to Siena Heights College in Adrian, Michigan. Uh, Chloe and Reagan being state champs, they already have everybody knocking down the doors and asking for them. So it's something that was really exciting. It was, it was great to see uh, the wrestling community embrace the girls at the state uh, tournament this year. Uh, the girls were at the Schottenstein Center at the same time as the boys. So when the finals were going on, there were three mats of boys, one mat of girls, uh, and the community really embraced. So the wrestling community is growing, and the reason they're growing is because of these girls. And we're super proud of what they do in the classroom, on the mat, outside of the school. Uh, these are all quality girls. Uh, as coaches, we hold them responsible for a lot of things, and, and they answer the call, and then some. So we are extremely proud of all of our girls. We have a full team of girls and a full team of boys, and they work together very well. And as coaches, we, we make sure that we uh, have the girls supporting the boys and the boys supporting the girls, and, and that's the way we're going to grow our sport. And, and these girls are doing an outstanding job in making our school proud, making their parents proud, uh, making themselves proud. So uh, strong females, uh, like you said, we're really proud that we have strong females here. Awesome. We're going to get the proclamation to you. And is Bridget here to tell us how we're going to do it? Okay, we'll figure it out. Bridget, how do you want us? Come around? Okay, we'll come around. Yeah, yeah one of the girls come behind us because they haven't seen them. I know we did a pre video shoot, but we want everyone on YouTube and everyone. We'll stay right here. Because everybody on YouTube, they haven't seen the girl. Okay. Yeah. Well, commissioners, every week we got winners, winners, winners. Yeah. Hamilton County, winning county. Okay, now we will go to our agenda. Um, today we have a presentation by ODOT on the Brent Spence Bridge Project. Um, all three of us joined uh, President Biden and uh, for the White House announcement of funding mm -hmm. for the bridge. And um, people heard about the money is there. The Brent Spence Bridge, I think all three of us have indicated it's very important for commerce, for tourism, and for safety. And um, I was just happy to see it. I didn't know if we'd be able to see it in our lifetimes. And we, we have. Uh, so now that money and presentations have been made, we want to find out what is going on uh, with the bridge, and I didn't know, Jeff, did you want to kick this off, or how do you want to do it, or you want? Uh, no, if, if, if anything, uh, Mr. Beck, maybe. Beck, I don't know if you have any opening comments that you wanted to make. Eric Beck over our. Thank you. Um, again, this is a, a monumental project for the community, and uh, I'm really happy to introduce Tammy Campbell's a dir uh, District 8. Um, Deputy Director, and Tom Arnold is the, what's your name, Tommy? Uh, Deputy Project Manager. Deputy Project Manager for the Brent Spence Project. And Tommy will be presenting today, and I'm sure they can both answer all your questions. And uh, I look forward to hearing what they have to say. Okay. Welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President, Commissioners, and thank you, Eric, for the introduction. 
Again, my name is Tom Arnold. I'm the deputy project manager for the Ohio Department of Transportation. Uh, and soon we'll be stepping into the role as project manager for the project. So very much excited to be here. And uh, speaking of winning, you know, like you said, um, this is a, a huge win that we had with the grant that was awarded. So I'll talk a little bit about that today and give you a project update. So, oh, here we go. So really have three key points. So first I wanna give you a, a quick project overview you know, this project's been in the works really since uh, the early 2000s, although the bridge was restriped all the way back in the 80s. So we knew we had some work to do going back that far. So I want to give you an update on what the purpose and need is of the project uh, and, and a little bit of the history. Um, and then next, I'll go over some of the project details. Uh, there's been a lot of work underway, especially in the last few years, as we're working on our supplemental environmental document. So I want to bring you up to speed there. And then finally, I want to give you a glimpse of some of our next steps. Uh, so we're going to be using a design build approach for the major portion of the project. So I'll walk you through what that means and what the schedule is. OK, so project overview. So our project goals here, um, are, that's our purpose and need on the project. We do have a transportation project, a transportation need that we're addressing. Um, the Brent Spence Bridge represents the second worst trucking bottleneck in the country. And that's been a stat for a long time, and it's one I re just looked up recently, like, is it still number two? And yes, it is. It's still the second biggest trucking bottleneck in the country, and it moves more than $1 billion worth of freight every day, which works out to be about 3% of the GDP over the course of the year. So it's obviously a critical connection, not only for our region, but for the nation as well. Project overview, a lot of times we think, or we just hear about the bridge, we think maybe it's just a bridge project, but it is much more than that. It's actually an eight mile corridor that starts down in Dixie Highway in Northern Kentucky, comes across the river and then ties into the city and county's Western Hills Viaduct project and also the work that we did at Hopple Street to the north. Um, we are building a new companion structure immediately west of the existing Brent Spence, but we are keeping the current Brent Spence in service. So we'll talk through how that work, how those two work together. Um, there are interchange updates, interstate reconstruction, all of that adds up to a total of $3.6 billion for the entire project, and that's for all segments of the, of the project and includes construction and design, right-of-way, the whole thing. We are going to construct the project in three phases. The yellow phase to the north, we currently have funded in fiscal year 28, but we have some flexibility there as we are coordinating with the city and county's Western Hills Viaduct project. So we've got the funds in place to tie in there. Uh, the next segment to the south, which is in red, and that's from about Lynn Street to Ezra Charles, uh, that project is also going to be constructed through a both of those, the yellow and red projects will be built through our normal process. We do a set of plans, we put it out to bid, and we select a contractor on the low bid. That project is also funded in fiscal year 25 um, for us, so th those are in play. But the, for the rest of the presentation today, I'm mostly gonna focus on what's in blue. And that is the six mile corridor that starts around Dixie, comes across the river, and uh, ends at Lynn Street. That, portion of the project is going to be constructed with a design build uh, procurement and that has the big bridge in it and is over three billion dollars so that's the the big phase we'll be talking about so what does the project look like i will re recommend that everyone check out our project website which i'll give you the the link here at the end because um, we do have a 3d simulation that you can that you can view and i think that really tells the story but i didn't want to try that in a presentation if it didn't work out so i have just a few slides for you uh, to show you. So in Ohio, we are widening 75, adding one lane in each direction. We are rebuilding all of our overpasses and bridges. Um, the big thing is that for, for downtown Cincinnati and for Covington, we are splitting traffic and creating a collector distributor. So today, when you head downtown, it can be kind of confusing. There's ramps on the left, there's ramps coming on from the right, traffic's cutting across, there's a lot of weaving. In the future, with, the, with our base design, we're creating a collector distributor so that if you're heading through on the interstate, you stay to the left and you bypass through Covington and Cincinnati downtowns. If you're heading to town, then you stay to the right and all the ramps will be on and off the collector distributor system. So it's going to be a simpler experience for drivers as they come through downtown uh, but still have an excellent form of access uh, to both CBD central business districts. And then we're, of course, keeping our major connections with I-71, 75, and US-50. 
Uh, I already mentioned we, we do tie into the Western Hills Viaduct project, but I did want to highlight that we're adding a new northbound exit ramp to Ezra Charles, which will help traffic get to the TQL Stadium as well as the Museum Center. Again, at the, at the bridge, uh, we're building a new companion structure just immediately west of the existing bridge, and the interstate traffic will be on that new bridge. It will also be a double-decker double decker structure, five lanes in each direction, and the local traffic will be on the existing bridge. Today, the existing bridge is very narrow, narrow lanes, no shoulders, four, four lanes in each direction. We're going to be taking that back to how it was originally intended. So it'll be three lanes in each direction with shoulders, so it'll be much uh, improved. And then in Kentucky, starting at the river and then heading south up the cut in the hill and down to Dixie, uh, again, there's re reconstruction of the of the um, of the interstate and uh, connecting the Dixie and Kyle's Lane interchanges together. So that's a quick overview of the project, um, you know, at a high level. What I like to do now is kind of talk through a, an update on what activities we've been working on here recently in the, in the last several months. Uh, and then again, we'll get to the next steps here coming up soon. And I have a few other project details to share with you here. So public engagement is absolutely the cornerstone of everything we do on this project. This is the website. I definitely recommend that folks check it out if they haven't been there yet. It prompts you to sign up for our e-newsletters, which are a great source of information. We've been sending those out for the last uh, several months. Uh, and so you can see the old newsletters there and then make sure that you're on the list for when the new ones come out. Uh, in, at the end of 2022, we also visited all of the community councils and communities in the project limits for a, a presentation that was more tailored to each port, part of the project since it's such a huge area. Um, so that was a, a lot of great outreach that happened. We also had um, community-wide presentations during those, uh, during those months as well. We have a big social media presence. Of course, we've had public hearings on the project in the past, and we have another round coming up this summer as we work on our supplemental environmental assessment. And then we have project committees as well. So we have an advisory committee to the project. Uh, we also have an aesthetics committee and then a diversity inclusion outreach committee that we'll talk a little bit more about today. So we're doing all that outreach, and so what, what, what's the feedback we get? So we've condensed a lot of the feedback we've gotten, and certainly we've had specific questions, and we've provided answer to those, answers to those, and you can see those on our website. But I think this slide just shows a summary of the shared community priorities that we've heard and that we've taken into our contract and into our project. So uh, I won't necessarily read all of this. I know it's a lot of text here, but reconnecting communities, returning public land, uh, separating local and through traffic. These are things that we have brought into our contract. I'm going to talk a little bit later about how we're doing a design build um, procurement for the project. That means we're going to build in, a, we're going to bring in a designer and a contractor together in one contract, and they'll be finishing the design up and building the project. And we've listed these uh, as project contract objectives within those documents. So they're going to under, they will understand where we are coming from and how uh, we are looking for the project to be developed. So from these community uh, priorities, we've also made some changes now. There's been some things we've been able to incorporate up front. One example here is from the city of Cincinnati. They have asked for uh, if there's any potential to return land um, from the project that could be potentially developable. And so with the city's feedback, we made a number of changes here. The big ones were um, instead of eliminating the entrance ramp from 4th Street, but then creating a new one at 3rd, and then eliminating the southbound 75 exit to 5th, because there's, there's other access points that serve that. And those changes, uh, along with a few other uh, tweaks, allowed us to return almost 10 acres worth of de developable land to the city uh, or to the local community. And it's just on the west edge of downtown. So this... Um, Next picture here gives you a rendering of what that could look like from the firefighters memorial. We've got it shown just as trees for now, um, but we'll have the chance to uh, get into the details when the design build team comes on board uh, to make it to uh, craft how that's graded and how that is returned once the project is complete. Moving to the Western Hills Viaduct again, just wanted to show you here that we have, uh, we, we continue to work with uh, the county and with the city on how our project, how the ODOT project at the interchange ties into the Western Hills Viaduct. Um, there will be a new local access that connects down to Harrison in this area. So this is a little bit of an older version. We've just recently made 
another tweak to this in coordination and in response to local feedback. So more to come on this, but we'll continue to work together as we have uh, to, to make sure these projects go in concert. One of the other things we heard a lot about was what about reconnecting communities and accommodating bikes and pedestrians on the project? So this is just a quick example, but we on the overpasses that go over 75, we'll be adding shared use paths on bike lanes and sidewalks where it makes sense, shared use paths on all the major uh, bridges as they go across along with the shared, a new shared use path along Winchell. Um, so those will be definitely improved connections. Um, I have a slide coming up that has a little bit more detail about that as well. This is a rendering overall for the project. It does show the arch concept. There's another, art, another aesthetic option out there, which would be the two-tiered cable stay. So that's a decision that will be made uh, once we bring the design build team on board. Do we go with the cable stay or the arch? This just gives you a little picture of what the arch could look like. But dialing in more to the local street connection, following on my last slide, uh, this is a look at uh, Union Terminal and Ezra Charles. Today, that overpass really works as two bridges, and there's a gap in the bridge, which is can be confusing. So our project is going to tie that in as one project, and then it also provides sidewalk and shared use paths on either side of the bridge. And instead of the typical chain link fence you would see as a vandal protection, we're providing translucent screens that actually can be backlit. And this came from our aesthetics committee with feedback uh, from our local partners on the project. Okay, so moving forward with next steps. The first next step was getting the funding in place. Uh, so Ohio and Kentucky have worked very closely together throughout project development, and we are very thankful to the county and to the city of Cincinnati and our local partners on the applications that we put forth. We had more than 200 letters of support on the project, which is a huge number. Uh, and so that was a very successful effort. We were able to secure uh, more than $1.6 billion in federal funds from the new infrastructure bill for the project, and without which the project would still be on hold or we'd still be working to find a way forward. What's coming up with our schedule here? Um, as I mentioned, we've done neighborhood outreach, uh, which means we, we attended community council meetings in 2022. Um, moving forward, we will be doing public hearings in the summer as we aim to wrap up our supplemental environmental assessment in the fall of this year, 2023. There will be more of a ceremonial groundbreaking in the fall, but construction will really pick up in earnest in, later in 2024. Our goal is to open the new companion structure by 2029 with some additional work to wrap up the project in 2030. Uh, this is just dials in a little bit on what's coming up in the next few months. As I mentioned, we're bringing on a design build team. So we are in that uh, request for proposal stage right now. Uh, the proposals were due March 31st. We've gotten a number of questions from potential offerers, so we've delayed that submittal until April 7th. Uh, but we're still on track for a May uh, parent best value announcement, which would be when we announce the design build team. And then a notice to proceed in July. And then wrapping up, this is not only a historic project for our region, but this is also a historic opportunity for diversity and inclusion on the project. And when we think of that, we think of that in a couple different ways. One would be contracts and careers. So on the contract side, we've done a lot of outreach to our communities um, looking for uh, the opportunities to involve disadvantaged business enterprises because we have federal funds. We have to meet the DBE requirements that are set forth by the federal government. And we've had three networking events so far in the last nine months. Each one's been better than the, than the last. So our last one was in March. We had more than uh, 260 folks uh, sign up for that and attend. And those were opportunities for uh, DBE firms to meet with prime consultants and contractors. And it's on all aspects of the project. So opportunities to meet the potential design build teams and opportunities to also meet consultants that'll be working with uh, with Ohio and with Kentucky on the project. So a lot of outreach done to date, and we have several more events planned uh, on the DBE networking front. Um, two of those involve uh, participating in events that the city of Cincinnati already have uh, on the books. Uh, one's coming up in June and another in September. So a lot of outreach uh, aimed at businesses and providing opportunities to pursue uh, contracts on the project. On the workforce development side, um, we are partnering with Allied Construction Industries, ACI, and attending their construction careers uh, 
event that's coming up in May. That has a, an adult um, career fair on the first day, and then high school students are invited in the next two days. So a lot of exciting things to come on those two fronts. We've also created a diversity inclusion outreach committee and invited the city of Cincinnati. We've invited the county and other, uh, other uh, advocates that are working in that space already in the region with the idea being, one, how can we use this project to amplify the good work that's already being done in this area? Um, and then two, it's just spreading the word about the project. How can we get word out about the opportunities that are coming to us? Um, we've also worked closely with Kentucky, setting up a reciprocity agreement. We're looking to expand that to Indiana. So if a firm is already uh, qualified as a DBE in Kentucky, they don't have to go through that process again in Ohio. They can work on the project and it, and it, uh, it counts towards the effort, so. In summary, It'll go through. One more, one more slide. I'm certainly going to take any questions. Okay. Oh, something's happening. Well, I can read it for you. Because sometimes I think of it as like, look, if you go to a family party and they say, oh, yeah, they're getting rid of the bridge, right? Now, now you can answer some of these key points is no, there's a second bridge being built and we're keeping the existing one too. So a couple of key points like that, we all need to be on the same page. It is a $3.6 billion overall cost, eight miles worth of highway work. We're building it with three different projects. Um, we've done a lot of community engagement and we'll continue to do so. There's a new ramp coming to Ezra Charles. We continue to connect to the Western Hills Viaduct. Um, there will be bike and bed facilities as well as aesthetics included on the project. And preparing for our next steps, we're bringing on a design build team uh, here soon in May public hearings coming up this summer, and there are a lot of opportunities for uh, DBE and workforce uh, opportunities on the project. So with that, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to give you an update on the project and answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much for uh, the presentation. Um, I think we all agree that this is transformational. It's, um, we'll never see anything like this in our lifetime. And so in doing so, we've got to make sure that we get it right. Yes. I want to congratulate you on your um, new position that is happening. Um, I had a chance to work a lot with ODOT uh, when I was at the State House, and we worked on a lot of projects. One of the things I want to start off with when we talk about partnerships, we have a lot of, uh, uh, you talked about a lot of uh, committees that don't have really any teeth, but we're going to listen and hear from you. And what I really can't understand, um, and maybe Mr. Beck can help me and uh, Jeff Aludo, um, is that we apply to be at the table as a county, third largest county in Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, we are the county. Cincinnati is in Hamilton County. And when you're building something like this uh, that has national money and national attention, uh, people are going to expect that the county has a role. They're going to, you, if you mess up, they're going to come running us because they can't find you, but they'll come running us. And I received this from Mr. Ludo, and maybe uh, Mr. Ludo, you could talk more about it, but we applied at the urging of our engineer uh, who handles our projects, particularly the Western Hill Viaduct and things that we're, uh, as a county, the county taxpayers are going to be paying the bulk of that uh, project. And you've talked about connectivity to those things. And we received a letter on March 24th that to Mr. Ludo on behalf saying that we were asking to be cooperating agency. And that's a partnership. And we received back that uh, we were declined. So I'm trying to figure out how do we get it to, not this, not these, uh, you come and we gonna talk and we wanna be at the table with some juice, some skin in the game. Cause we got some skin in the game with Western Hills Viaduct. So could you tell us how we as a county, our engineer, our county commission, can be at the table when we're making these types of decisions. 
because we were declined. I don't know if that was you. No, I understand. U.S. Department of Transportation, not you. From Federal Highway. Ohio Division. But is there anything you can help us out with? Sure. So that, that letter came from the Federal Highway Administration. And there are specific definitions with cooperating agency and partnering agency. And there, there's an example they give is a, a cooperating agency, I believe, often has a legal role to play. So like, for instance, the Army Corps of Engineers, they have to do their own environmental process. And so typically a federal agency like that ends up being a cooperating agency and they rely on the environmental document for the project. And so that's the that's the relationship that gets called out there. On the project level, it wouldn't change anything because ODOT and the county are working together already. Um, Eric can maybe speak more to that as well, but the, but Eric, uh, the county engineer has been uh, part of our advisory committee on the project um, where we you know, you know, have been bringing up project updates and opportunities for decisions along the way during project development. I believe it's been in place uh, probably going back to 05 since the project started in the NEPA process. Uh, and then the city and county are also um, part of our uh, team that will be reviewing the proposals when they come in from the design build team. So they're part of the team there as well. And um, we will continue to work together on uh, opportunities as they move forward. Got you. Mr. Beck was the reason we applied for this. So I don't know, Mr. Beck, you want to tell us why did we need this? I know advising and decision making are two different things, but maybe I want to make Yes, it uh, some of the reason was uh, partially the MSD consent decree with the stormwater. Um, how that, the, you know, the stormwater is going to be handled coming off the bridge and going into combined sewers. Um, yes, myself as a county engineer is on the advisory committee, but I'm looking at transportation needs. Um, I'm not really the expert in the development end and the stormwater and the MSD portion. And that's why in discussions with Jeff Aluto that we decided that we would ask, make this ask to be a cooperating agency. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Madam President. Yes, I had a procedure on my neck, so it's hard to turn right <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. But I would turn Mr. Ludo. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, Engineer Beck hit, hit you know, on the head, and I appreciate that uh, you know, this was a, a decision by uh, uh, Federal Highway Administration, not by ODOT. But um, you know, I think in general, I think our, our application for cooperating agency status was made just given the uh, substantive nature of the county's involvement on a host of issues uh, related uh, to to this project. I mean, we we know the, the board board of county commissioners um, as the governing body for this county um, has to represent the interests of residents um, on everything from transportation issues to economic development to noise, et cetera. And I realize some of those issues may not rise to the threshold. Of cooperating agency status, but there is also there are also very specific areas uh, where the county's involvement, I think, um, does or should trigger that. Clearly, we received an, uh, a contrary indication from FHWA. But number one, the county's role as principal uh, of the Metropolitan Sewer District, um, which uh, will, in fact, uh, there will be implications for the sewer system and for stormwater with uh, the construction of this project, as well as. Um, the, the county's role as it relates to uh, the monitoring of air quality for the southwestern Ohio uh, region and the very direct role we have in that. So the county had sev has several um, functional areas that we provide to the community uh, where we believe, we still believe, that there is uh, direct involvement to the degree that cooperating agency status is justified. So we did receive that notice um, uh, on Friday. We're, we're scheduling a follow-up call. Um, with FHWA to discuss it in more detail. But at the end of the day, to answer your question about why, it's to ensure that this Board of County Commissioners and the county has um, a seat at the table in a way that is um, it, as uh, justified by law and governing law as, as much as possible. Um, and we know that these types of pro projects are governed by a large volume of complex rules and regulations in terms of how information is dispersed, how it gets out there. And we do agree that we have a very good relationship with ODOT, and we know that relationship will continue. Uh, but there's, as you indicated, there's going to be only one chance to get this right. And to the degree we've got that seat at the table, um, we just feel better positioned to represent the, uh, the interests of the county and its residents. Jeff, and I'd like to add that you know, we want to make sure that any comments that we make are meaningful and that they're considered by the, the entire project team. And, and like Jeff said, we do have a great working relationship 
with the Ohio Department of Transportation, and I'm sure they'll listen to us, but if we don't have any teeth, does, will we really affect any change? Right. Well, that's what I was saying. So thank you very much. So our next step is what? You're going to follow up on this? or yeah. how, well, Do we have another shot at this? Because Jeff and I are working on setting up a call right now to follow up on that, yes, okay. with the right. FHWA. Okay. That's very important that we have a seat at the table because people are going to be holding us accountable. Everybody else, they'll run back to Washington, they'll run up to Columbus, but we got to live here. Yes. So uh, thank you for that. I had another question on um, my other question you had on your funding model. We got a grant for $1.385 billion, which was incredible. I want to thank the uh, folks that worked on it and Biden administration and former Senator uh, Portman and Senator Sherrod Brown and others, uh, Kentucky uh, governor, et cetera. Where does the rest of the money come from to finish it? Sure. It says $3.6 billion. Yes, and, it's act and that was just one of the grants. The other grant was about $250 million, so it adds up to over $1.6 billion total. There was two grants that we secured from the transportation uh, discretionary grants that were available. Yeah. So the rest of the funds are being provided by Ohio and Kentucky. Okay. So essentially, uh, the two governors have signed uh, an agreement to deliver the project. Uh, essentially, Ohio, Ohio pays for the work in Ohio. Kentucky pays for the balance, the balance of the work in Ohio, the balance of the work in Kentucky. And then we split the bridge 50-50. Okay. Now, I do want to I acknowledge the governor of Kentucky. I, of course, acknowledge our, our governor, too, uh, Governor DeWine. Uh, so that was good. To, so we've got the money. Um, my next question is, when you go to design, well, before that, Ezra Charles, there's been some rumor that Ezra Charles, I know they gave him a statue, but people were concerned in the community that they were going to get rid of the Ezra Charles exit. That's something that the late great William Mallory Sr. got done with Ezra Charles. And the reason it was downtown, that was his district. Ezra Charles lived in Avondale, but at that time it was hard to get stuff for African-Americans in Avondale. So he got it downtown. It worked with ODOT back then, uh, which I have to say he must have been really good because ODOT was different than it is today uh, and was able to get this exit. Is Ezra Charles Street at risk of losing that name? I just want to, this is what the people asked, so I wanted to get it on record. No, in fact, we're adding a new ramp to Ezra Charles heading in the northbound direction. Awesome. Love that. Now, let's get to your diversity and inclusion piece. And we, you know, a lot of people, we have our equity and inclusion director here, Mr. Robert Bell. I know you've said you had several meetings. I have been getting calls. I'm very active, and I come through civil rights my whole life and on national boards, uh, with Civil Rights National Action Network National Board. And I've been getting a lot of calls. I've been the former president of Ohio Legislative Black Caucus. So when things happen down this way, I get a lot of calls. And I received uh, the American Center for Economic Equality and the Black Contractors Group, Inc. And I think they got chapters in Cleveland, uh, Columbus, and uh, are working with contractors here at Cincinnati and across the country. And my phone has been jumping off the hook. Um, in fact, there's a letter that we have, and I probably would like, like to have this in the record, uh, that was sent to the Secretary, U.S. Secretary uh, Buttigieg, and it talks about your meetings that you, talk, that you indicated. Uh, Mr. Norman Edwards, who is the president of the Black Contractors Group, and many other calls have come in, have asking me what's going on. That's why the county needs a seat at the table, uh, because I could not answer it, because we are not at the table, as Mr. Beck has indicated. In here, it talks about design bill, which sounds good, but he says that, that he attended uh, the meet and greet and outreach on Tuesday, March 7th, 2023, said it was at the Radisson Hotel in Covington, Kentucky. And um, holding on that point with this being Kentucky and Ohio putting the money in, I'm going to tell you, I want to make sure that Ohioans get some jobs. I know you mentioned Indiana. We appreciate it. But Ohioans, we're looking for this to turn this around for us 
and I'm sure Kentucky's looking for it to turn around for them. So I'm, I'm not too excited about trying to get Indiana, what you call reciprocity. I'm interested in Ohioans getting these jobs, particularly down here, uh, if I would be more frank about it. But he indicated he went to a, a meeting you had over in Covington. And he said, he, was, he said, I am extremely saddened to report that despite my hopes that things were about to take a turn for the better towards economic equality and diversity, I found that it was business as usual. The Walsh slash Kokosing joint venture team already has, a, already has awarded the project to the chosen majority contractors leaving the minimal crumbs as scraps for the disenfranchised black and minority businesses. The proposals just went out last week and are not due until June, yet the pie has already been sliced before we can even get to the table ensuring no significant black or minority participation. All five companies, he said, were there. All are working together on the same team. This is clearly, he says, collusion and contract steering at its worst. And he goes on and on, but he talks about the crumbs. And I just want to make sure a lot of times we have these meet and greets. You know, everybody show up and we have little results. So we got some issues. We got the contracting issues on construction. We've got the contracting issues on consulting and the soft cost piece that usually are not competitively bid. Then you have the jobs piece. A lot of times we want to get the jobs, but they put us down at the jobs piece. So this has gone out nationally. Uh, this is on the, I think, the front page of the Cincinnati Herald, our black newspaper. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting calls from across the country. And I don't really want us to be in the news like that. And then to find out we're not even at the table. And then you'll say, well, y'all on the advisory group. And, you know, we had 200 people show up. Showing up and getting a contract is two different things. So I want to find out, since you brought up equity and inclusion, and I want to give you this so you have it in your hand. I've seen it. I want you to it's in your hand. Respond to it. And help us, where are we on this? Because I don't want the national folks running down here talking about shutting this project down. And that's what I've been hearing. I agree. So I think there's a, a misunderstanding in terms of contracts on the project, in terms of where we are in the process. So first, the March 7th event that we had was in Covington, and that's because we've alternated Ohio and Kentucky on each one. Yeah, so that's fine. we had one in, in, at the Anderson Center in Cincinnati, which was also an awesome event in December. So in March, um, those events are open to any prime consultant and or, con or contractor and any uh, DBE firm, really any firm can come and attend. So we had more than just potential design build teams there. We also had consultants that were interested in serving as ODOTs, uh, on ODOTs team as part of our project review or and also as part of our construction inspection and engineering group. So it was more than just the design build teams that were present at that uh, at event. There were um, a number of different prime consultants and contractors there. I think the, the main message I want to relay, one, is that I did get to meet Mr. Edwards at that event, and uh, you know I am excited to work with him. We agree that we want to make the most of this opportunity on the project, um, and one of the things that the design build team is going to have to do right off the bat is create a diversity and inclusion outreach plan. And the reason that that's key on this type of project is this project's going to be different than our normal projects that are out there. Normally, we open bids, and the contractor uh, has to have their whole team there ready to go, and, uh, and that, that is the low bid, and they proceed with the project. On this project, we're doing what's called progressive design build, which, we've, which has not been done in the state of Ohio to this point. So first, what we'll be doing is bringing on the team, and they will have their design crew, their design team of firms identified when we review and award the contract at first. But they will be, there will be time to bring on contractors later when we get closer to construction. So the project's really broken into two phases. There's a design phase, which will start off soon, and then a construction phase that comes later. So there's plenty of time for uh, contractors to be included and involved in the project when it comes to construction. So there are not, there have been no decisions made. ODOT hasn't awarded anything. Um, so there, there's still a plenty of time for that work to happen. 
Yeah, I just want to make sure that the minorities are not on the back end. That happens all the time. Um, and uh, our board has been very active in changing some of that. And I know it's hard. And I know uh, changing it. But I was at a OKI luncheon and somebody jumped up and said they working on the bridge already. And people went to clap it. So when you said there's nothing out there, you said you've been working for some time. Are there any minorities working now, getting any type of contracts now? Because somebody jumped up and we were clapping for them. Well, the, the work that's been done so far has been environmental engineering, preliminary engineering type work. There's a consultant on board through ODOT uh, led by HNTB, and they have DBE firms involved in that uh, program. Again, because they're, they're federal funds, we, don't, we, don't, we can't specify if, if it's minority or female owned or what type, but, um, but we, they have just have to qualify as the DBE. So they have DBE firms involved on their team. But again, this is this this is a very small chunk of the big pie that's coming later. So we're preparing to bring on the design build team here coming up in May, and we'll again the, the design build team has to create a diversity inclusion and outreach plan, which gets submitted to the department right at the beginning, and that lays out how their the team is going to interact uh, with design with DBEs, how they're going to mentor them, how, involve them in the project. That's on the contract side, and then on the career side. Are they going to meet our on-the-job training goals uh, as well as workforce development? So this is a huge opportunity for folks that are interested in the construction career. Uh, a construction career, somebody could start this pro project, never have worked in construction, and finish up as a journeyman and have the Brent Spence Bridge on their resume. Yeah. That's what I'm looking forward to, to seeing through on this project. Yeah, I think on the jobs thing, you, you'll probably hit that. We always got a job or two there. In fact, uh, I think working with, uh, again, that's why we want to have a seat at the table. Um, Mr. Ludo can talk about this board. We have a workforce. I think we have uh, the Urban League. We just we're looking mm -hmm. at that we're funding and want to see if those folks can get connected with projects that we have. Um, and so I just want to make sure now when I get calls like this and they tell me that Secretary Fudge will be calling me and I'm going to be held accountable, I got a problem. So if you said you talked to Mr. Edwards, I don't know what the talk was because he just called me again today and told me that Secretary Fudge wants to know what's going on down here. And I find out county is not at the table except for advisory. Uh, you know, we don't have nothing really. You already have some, even if it's the small contracts, we want to be a part of it. I don't really like the word inclusion because it always says basically, we already got everything and we'll try to squeeze you in. We're talking taxation without participation. And we want to make sure that everyone comes to the table at the same time. And so they have the same opportunity. And I know we do these things say, oh, come on out. And we have a big buffet of people and nobody gets a contract. That's not what we're trying to do when we're talking about would you say $3.6 billion in changing the trajectory of what this region is going to be? When we come out of this, there should be some, you know, minority business, women-owned business. Somebody should come out of here and say, man, look at my company. This is what we've done because the opportunity is here. No one should come out of this project and they just as broke as they was before we had a bridge project because they don't have opportunity. I'm saying that to you because you said you're going from deputy to the director. And I'm just saying we've got to have something different. I know we're not at the table, uh, but we're going to fight hard to get at the table. But these are the calls. They, you know, they're calling me. Why would they call me? I ain't even at the table. They're not happy, and I don't want national news, national civil rights organizations running down here, National Action Network, NAACP, Urban League, uh, women's groups, environmental groups, all chained saying we're not going to have this bridge because – we've been left out and we're doing business as usual. So I'm putting that on the table since you're in, at the table, we're not at the table. We're just looking from the outside. Uh, this has to, has to move in a different, somebody's getting paid right now. And it's got to be moving in a different direction. I hear you, it's a huge priority for us. It's one of our top priorities on the project. We'll continue to make it one. And there are still, there's plenty of time for folks to get involved in the project, especially when it comes to construction. And again, part of the reason that there aren't contracts necessarily being awarded at, in the March 7th event is the design build team still has to do design work. So they still have to get down into the weeds a little bit. That first phase that they do is called a proof of concept. So that's what happens in the first six to nine months 
where they come up with a design that meets our requirements. And once that's done, then they start dialing into the details and then construction comes after that. So there's time yeah. to get involved. No, I got you. But sometimes people say, why can't they be on the design build team? You know, so I'm just bringing those things up because this is a huge part. It's not like a five, ten million dollar project. This is three point six billion dollars is going to change the trajectory of how we're doing it. We're even doing a bridge different. So we need mm -hmm. to kind of think a little bit different. Um, and then no matter what your race is, I want Ohio, I want Cincinnati, I want Hamilton County to be, I want to see some numbers showing Hamilton County residents benefited from the jobs, the contracts, the opportunities. Uh, we don't necessarily need you to highlight what we're doing. We need you to partner with what we're doing. You said you were going to highlight us. We just passed the first ever MBE, WBE, and small business program in the county's history. So we got people ready to go from Hamilton County, and I just want them to have gotten some benefit before, besides we, got, we get a chance to drive over the bridge. We got a chance to help build it, uh, develop it, uh, be a part of it, and I just want to put that out there. I know you said Indiana. I'm going to just say it one more time. <laughs> I'm not for no reciprocity for Indiana, to be honest. I'm for Hamilton Countyans to be able to, you can show me. Look what we did in Hamilton County. Look how many jobs. Look how many. I'm interested in that so that we can be a part of saying, hey, wow. And I'm sure Kentucky is interested as that uh, in that as well. So just wanted to highlight that and also tell you that, uh, you know, this is a huge thing. Um, this is huge for our, our county. It's going to be transformative, and uh, we're excited to uh, get it started. I'll open it up to Vice President Treehouse. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for the presentation. Thank you, Tammy, for being here. Appreciate it. Um, this is a huge opportunity for us uh, in this region, for the city, for the county, for the residents, for Kentucky. It's just, you know, as has been stated, it's a once-in-a-lifetime kind of project when it comes to building this bridge, which we've been waiting on for many, many years. Uh, and so glad that the federal government stepped up. The Biden administration provided funding. It was bipartisan. It has all the hallmarks of uh, leading into a great project. And so, and I've talked to uh, Tammy and others about the, the lens that you have related to ODOT, to moving cars and, and pedestrians and bikes and the transportation nature of a bridge. And then the perspective that I have, and I think we all have as elected officials, related to all of that uh, because it all pertains to commerce and the residents here and in Kentucky and elsewhere, but also this economic development lens that we are putting on this project to make sure that we don't miss opportunities to do really big things um, in this region related to the bridge and the reconstruction of some of those highways on either the Kentucky side or the Ohio side. And I know there's a representative from Bridge Forward here Appreciate you being here. I know the city has been vocal on this too, but so has the county and uh, and others related to freeing up some of that land next to the convention center. What a huge opportunity that will be for us as we think about the convention center, the hotel, and all of that area as one big district that we can reconfigure in partnership to make it the best that it can be to bring folks into this region uh, for economic development purposes, tourism, and all, all the rest of it that, that relates to convention centers. So I'm very excited. I, originally, we had been looking for just a few acres of land, thought that might do it, but we're up to 10, and that's good. Um, so I'm glad that we could, in partnership with others, to be fair, uh, work on that and take a different look, a different really approach to that spaghetti highway um, that goes to the north of the bridge. So I'm, I'm delighted to see that and uh, looking forward to how we as a board of county commissioners look at that in conjunction with what the city is doing. Um, so I, I want to hone in on this um, cooperating agreement issue. Uh, I know that was um, a decision made by the federal government, federal transportation. I will tell you it's very disappointing um, that we are not going to be a cooperating agency, not only because we have this um, really big part to play when it comes to this bridge as, as the county to the north, but also because, as it's been mentioned, uh, some of the really um, impactful things to our systems, like stormwater, 
MSD. We already have issues related to combined sewers and overflows in this area. And so there's going to be a significant impact from all this impervious surface to you know our um, our systems, our, our infrastructure that we have to deal with. So I'm wondering if that stands, and I know we're going to follow up and see if we can uh, have a change of heart, perhaps at the federal level. I, I don't know how optimistic we should be about that, but can you help us better understand then if, if that is not the case? Um, and we don't succeed there. What is the avenue for our participation? I, the, I know the engineer is involved in, in some of the design and some of the other things that you referred to and, and the engineer referred to, but I think this board is looking for a, a significant role when it comes to thinking broadly about the impacts uh, to our, the things that we have to deal with um, on, you know, from, from the county perspective. So are there other ways for us to get involved when it comes to some of the planning, the strategic thinking related to the bridge? Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner. I think for one thing that the MSD has been mentioned and coordination there. So we have been working with MSD already and we have another meeting coming up uh, soon. I think I think it's in early April. So we'll certainly continue to collaborate on that effort and how the project interacts with stormwater and the system in that area. So we've worked at the table uh, together with MSD and ODOT trying to come up with a solution that works for all there. So that's one example. We'll continue that practice. Um, when it comes to the diversity inclusion outreach, uh, we're looking for feedback and direction from, um, from the members of that committee. So uh, we've, we don't have a meeting right now because we're trying to bring on the design build team. So that's our focus right now because when, as I mentioned before, when that design build team comes on, they have the plan. They are the ones who are actually hiring folks and hiring contractors to work on the project. We set the goals and, and the requirements and then we have our outreach that we're doing there too, but we're looking for advice from uh, members of that committee to help shape that effort so the county can certainly have a voice there as well. Um, the county's already engaged in reviewing the proposals when they come in, so we'll certainly that'll still continue to be an opportunity there. And then uh, when we get into that proof of concept phase, when we start looking at designs, what we're expecting is, especially in the first two months, uh, a lot of innovation to come from the design build team. We've done a number of design build projects over the years where we put out our base design knowing that this will work, but very excited to see when design build teams come back and say, well, here's a way you can give back even more land because we've listed that as an objective, or here's a way that we can uh, reduce the cost or build the project in a more streamlined way. So we're very excited to get some of those suggestions. Those will have to go through a vetting process uh, and before they move forward. So we can certainly engage with the county during that as well. Um, I know the city has created an advisory committee for the city um, just to make sure that they're getting all, uh, making sure they're hearing all voices amongst their constituents. Um, so perhaps there's a way that we could work together and we could talk with the county about opportunities to do something similar on the project. We're still putting together um, how some of those mechanics will work, but perhaps we could um, leverage a similar type scenario uh, for reviewing concepts as they come in, especially in that early, those early critical first few months when different ideas are being brainstormed to tweak the base design. Well, and, and as we as you think about uh, choosing uh, the RFP winner, you know, what what's the um, what's in place for the follow up to make sure that those the parameters that are set forth in the RFP are then followed through on by the folks that are awarded the bids. And, and I, again, um, anxious, have some anxiety about the county not also be able, being able to participate on that piece. The county is participating in that piece from a review standpoint. So they'll get to review all the proposals and provide feedback. I'm talking about then. Uh, okay, then yeah, after. Yes, that, but after, after that, yeah. Okay, I understand. So, uh, the, so then following that, we do have a project management plan that we have, we're still drafting right now, but we've, uh, we're in that process of putting that together and that's what Federal Highway will hold us to account for. So perhaps there's an opportunity there um, to beef that up a little bit and uh, talk through some opportunities for how we'll measure success on the project as we move forward. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and I don't want to speak for others, but I think we are looking for a way to uh, be relevant partners here because this is such a big deal for the county. It's a big deal for the city, too. And so I don't want to um, diminish their participation, but 
I think we too want to be able to participate in a really significant way related to all things uh, related to the bridge. So a couple other questions, more much more specific kinds of questions. You mentioned um, allied construction uh, and helping with the workforce piece of this. Have you also engaged with the labor and the trades? We have, yes. There We have all of the, the local union um, uh, halls are part of our advisory committee. And we actually had our first meeting at the local uh, uh, laborers hall in Walnut Hills area. So we've certainly been engaged with them and we'll continue to do so. Okay. Um, I was going to hit on a little bit of the DEI, but I think we've um, already discussed that. The other piece is, um, and this is a very technical piece, the um, ramps going off of the design as it stands now. There was some conversation related to US 50. Has that changed from, or tell me where that is. So one of the parts of our purpose and need is to maintain critical connections, and that includes US-50. So our base design still includes connections to US-50. You mentioned Bridge Forward earlier. We have met with Bridge Forward uh, several times in the last few months. Just recently, they, they put out a new idea for how to handle US-50 through the project, and we're looking at that right now. It's still something that we're looking at in kind of in an early process or early stage right now. But keeping the connection of US-50 is a critical part of the project. Okay, thank you. And I, just lastly, I do want to recognize Bridge Forward was way ahead of the game on this one and has been working on how to think differently mm -hmm. about a transportation project uh, to their credit and put that economic de development lens on it and think about it in a way that um, opens it up for opportunities other than just the transportation piece. The one place where I may not be entirely in sync uh, with that group is the US 50 part. Um, being an, a West Sider, uh, I'm very concerned about the access moving out, especially coming from the South, pushing out to the West on US 50 and making sure that access continues to exist. So I, I, did, I haven't uh, looked in detail at the current plan, but I just wanted to throw that out there just to make sure that that's been addressed. And, and that area is complicated. So changes that we, there are ramifications to changes. So if we, if we lower or raise or, or move US 50, then something else moves and something else propagates down. And there've been a lot of changes to reduce the footprint already over the last several years. For instance, in the current design we have dramatically reduced the amount of impacts we had in Northern Kentucky. We went from around 40 residential relocations down to four. Uh, and so there's been a lot of changes there and we wanna make sure that we are um, still getting that same benefit. So we have to look at how little changes here affect the whole project. Yeah, th thank you. Well, and it, it just once again, that the reclaiming of the land to the west of the convention center is a huge opportunity for us, uh, whether it's expansion of the convention center exhibit space or something different, um, huge opportunity there. So um, I want to say that in, in partnership with you, Bridge Forward, the city, and other partners, we're, we're very excited about the potential in this project. So thank you so much Excellent. for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to make sure I clarify when we want a seat at the table, we're not trying to take the city of Cincinnati seat. We're trying to add a seat. Uh, I think that's important. And Bridge Forward, I do want to acknowledge, uh, I'd like to see Bucktown, uh, some uh, historical marker. They brought up Bucktown. If that's where the slaves came over for freedom and lived. We stayed there, our ancestors, uh, because it's supposed to be bad land. And we were moved out thanks to the bridge and thanks to the fact that people discovered that you can develop down on the bank. So I would like to put that on the list to look at Bucktown, some type of uh, acknowledgement that Bucktown did exist. So I want to thank Bridge Forward for bringing that up, and I hope that's in your notes. Thank you. Uh, okay, Commissioner Dumas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple comments. Um, I'm also extremely concerned about Hamilton County having a voice, uh, having a significant impact as we move forward. So we'll see how that goes as our staff work on that. Um, I've sat on three webinars, uh, and Eric was in all three of them that I remember. So we do have a voice on the webinar, but we want to have a, a strong voice. Um, I remember a discussion um, um, about the percentage of minorities um, that will be involved in this project. And I, I want to say 5% percent was mentioned um, and I may be off a little bit but I remember the business people that were on the webinar were saying that our percentage or your percentage that's been set for the design and construction is much lower 
than the state standard for a minority build. And I don't know where that is right now, but I know we want to get that straight on the on the front end uh, for sure. Were you getting ready to say something? I can answer okay. that question. If okay, you sure. Yeah, so our so the way the goal has been set, and really Brent Spence is like no other project, mm -hmm. just based on the size of it. ODOT's total budget every year is around $2 billion, and this project is north of three. Of course, it's over several years, but this is a huge project. So in order to set the DBE goal, we brought in a national firm that this is what they do. And so they followed the federal process for setting a goal, which looks at DBE availability relative to the work types that are expected on the project mm -hmm. and set, set a goal. And then we compare that to what we've actually achieved on our program. Mm -hmm. So that's how the goal is set. Um, so the goal right now is 9% for design for phase one. And again, that's really a design goal. Mm -hmm. And then we have a target for construction of 7%. And that will be revisited when we get closer to construction because okay. th that still has to be tweaked. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, Let's see, I have lots of scribbles, but I'm gonna say the completion of the whole project, um, you know, from the um, companion deck to the bridge, how long is that susp uh, supposed to be? So right now we're looking for completion in 2030 or early 2031. The bridge we are planning to open in 2029, and that will be a, a key component because once the new companion bridge is open, we'll, mm -hmm. we expect and again, the design build team is going to give us their thoughts here. So this, they will have a huge role in this, of course. But we expect the traffic will then shift over to the new bridge while they upgrade the existing bridge. So that's kind of like what happens in that 2030, early 2031 time frame. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and in addition, my concerns are, of course, safety, as we all are concerned about that. But minority and women businesses is, is another concern for me. And of course, labor is another concern because the percentage of labor to be used for this project is what? Did you break it down as far as labor? In terms of unions, female or, uh -huh. okay. So, well, we haven't, first of all, we have an on the job training goal of 15%. Mm -hmm. And so those are the goals that we set. Mm -hmm. um, and then I believe our, and I could, I might want to do some research and get back to you to give you the exact numbers sure. on what's expected in terms of the workforce side. Mm -hmm. um, if that would be okay, I could do Sure, that. that's fine. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. And um, I looked at your earlier, um, let's see, you had shared community priorities that you had on the board. And so I was surprised that inclusion was not a priority when you had your community meetings. I didn't see it listed. It is listed on our contract. So those, those objectives that were shown there were typical, some of the typical things we heard in public meetings or community meetings and those mm -hmm. You know, those a lot of times are just fo focused on the project, but certainly diversity and inclusion is a key priority for us, and it is listed as one of our top objectives on the project. Okay, but it didn't actually come out in the community meetings you were having, or not as strongly as those. It doesn't mean we haven't heard that, and we're planning for it as well. It's just that okay. I think those community conversations were more focused on where's this bridge here, and one okay. the shared use pair there. So the less about how it gets built, but. We recognize that this is a huge sure. opportunity for the mm -hmm. region. And my, lastly, um, the aesthetics committee, um, when I was on the last time, I think they were saying color. People were gonna have the opportunity to pick what color they wanted the bridge to be. Has that been decided or is it all the way down as we do design or? Not decided yet. There's a lot of uh, work to do there to, to get into some of the details. Mm -hmm. There's. We've got some direction on, uh, you know, what the bridges look like, especially the local bridges at Ezra Charles and whether there's plantings and when there's the screening and mm -hmm. things like that. But there's still some decisions that, that are going to need to come for the bridge. One of those being if it's a cable stay, I believe it needs to be white because of the heat on the cables. I believe that's mm -hmm. one requirement, um, but we can something we can or a lighter color, whatever mm -hmm. that would need to be. But again, th those are some design details that we get into down the road. Okay. And uh, I thought that was last, but lastly, for me, I always listen to the numbers as they come out. And earlier in your presentation, you mentioned 3.4 billion, and then as you went further, it was 3.6 billion. So I don't know what the 3.4. If was. I did, I, that was a mistake. If I said 3.4, it's 3.6 for the okay. is the total of all three phases, and then it is 3.1. Uh, is the lower number, and that is just the design build piece. Okay. 
That's all. Targets of nine and seven are applying on the okay. point one. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming. I, I, I think you've kind of heard from us, um, and we're hoping to hear something better from the federal side that we have a seat at the table. Um, we want to make sure that construction, building, trades, unions aren't left out. Um, and you said you're working with them. Um, and just one thing that I do want to add, if the state is putting in funding, I know we got to deal with the federal guidelines for the their half, but if the state is putting on their half, uh, ODOT, when I was there, they did a disparity study for the first time, and you had some goals. And the state law has goals for goods and services, which will be some goods and services. There's a 15% uh, set aside in the state law. So on the state side of the funding, are there opportunities? I know you mentioned the 9%. Are there opportunities because you have a, there is an MBE goal for goods and services. That's your consultants, um, supplies, because uh, there will be a lot of supplies being needed for this. Um, so that will be your goods and your services. Um, and I just want to say that that could be an opportunity because if we use the state money, which will be half of this, which is still a lot of money, um, using those goals in the supplies and uh, professional services areas, that will get us at 15 percent by state law with state money. And then there's a disparity study that ODOT had, and I can't remember, I don't have my numbers in front of me, but you did a very bold thing by having it. Um, it showed, you know, we were way down and you came with some new things. Um, I think using the state money could get us to a, and, and I think that we had some pretty good results when we, when they went that direction. So I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, I think we got to look a little more creative. I know the federal part will be DBE, but the state part has MBE, WBE, and will allow us to get women owned businesses, more of them, uh, minority businesses, more in the pipeline on the uh, goods and services side if somebody's supplying the the dirt for the landscape or someone pro providing uh, the uh, supplies equipment that type of thing so i wanted to put that on the table as well to, to maybe take a look as you're putting your plan together thank you for that suggestion and again the goals are minimum levels of participation and we have put this on the design build team to give us what their plan is and we're ex we're looking for how creative they are going to be as well as they're looking to pursue the contract so they have the ability to voluntarily do some more things than than we can require um i appreciate your suggestion we'll look into that more uh there there could be the answer that well there's federal dollars on the project so federal rules govern that's something that it's possible that that's the answer, but we'll look into that more. Yeah, and take a look. I, agree I have with never creative. seen people, if they were voluntarily doing it, we would never need an inclusion and equity department. We wouldn't need, we, we have these things because we've been at 0%, 1%. I think when I was there, ODOT was like 2%. So, and these companies, they're not going to voluntarily do it. This company that if you look for design build, when they did the Reds, uh, we have a youth complex, but the owners of the uh, baseball complex that we want inclusion, they did it. When they didn't have inclusion, they didn't do it. It was the same company. So I think that uh, it's important that we as uh, the government, because we collect taxes from diverse people, and we have to have, we cannot have taxation without participation. So I think your input will be uh, greatly needed and guided. And once you get the input, then people all of a sudden they discover that, oh yeah, we, we've got people, we can be inclusive. Yes, and the difference on the, for this project compared to our normal is normal, most of our projects are just low bid. So there's a goal and it's low bid, lowest bid wins. This one, bidding, a pricing is part of the selection, but it's much more of a qualifications driven uh, uh, selection and they, for instance, a diversity inclusion outreach manager is one of the 10 key personnel that they have to put on their team, show their experiences, what they've done, give us their resume, as well as their initial uh, diversity inclusion outreach plan. So we're, we do factor that into how we select the team, okay. which is different Thank than normal. You. Thank you so much. And Thank thanks you. for coming here. We'd like to have you back because everybody sure. wants to know what's going on. And uh, we hope that we'll have a seat at the table to be in full partnership with you. Uh, to get this done. This is it's going to be incredible for our for our entire state, our region, and our county. So thank you. Thank you very much. Right, can I just ask one more question? Sure. 
Um, it's transportation related, so it's uh, I, you mentioned the time frame, and so building the new bridge to the west, and then having the traffic shift over to that bridge while you work then on the current bridge. So what is the? So I know you're going to from four lanes to three lanes, uh, or is there a lot of construction involved, or is it more of a re redesign or reconfiguring? The existing. Yeah. The existing the, bridge. Yeah. The existing bridge will get a new deck. Uh, on it, so there will be construction on it. It's not replacing it or anything like that, but it is it is changing the deck, replacing the deck, and doing some maintenance work on the bridge. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious because I think that is one question we are going to be asked. You know, uh, what is the time frame, and, and when's this going to be closed, and what's that going to be closed? So, okay, so the, and that's at the very tail end of the project. And I should yeah, and I should clarify that's kind of how we anticipate the work will go. Okay. The the design build team does have to create a maintenance of traffic plan that it, that details out in a, a high level of detail exactly how they're going to do the project. So they could choose to do things in a different way, um, but but we'll certainly be working closely on that. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so Thank much. You. We'll see you soon. Okay, Thank sounds you. good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is a presentation from Jobs and Family Services Director Michael Patton. And uh, is Ms. Jackson here? And Trina Jackson from our reentry, it's a collaboration with Child Support Office of Reentry, and uh, I believe uh, Commissioner Dumas uh, has been working on this. I know uh, this is an issue uh, that she's been working on, so uh, happy to have this presentation. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, uh, Commissioners. Well, thank you for having us this afternoon uh, here today to talk a little bit, of, give you a little bit of background on the child support program in general. Some. Uh, key performance in indicators. I also have Monica Saylor, who's the Assistant Director of Child Support, uh, here today with me. He'll talk a little bit more about uh, the work we do uh, with child support, non-custodial parents on modification of orders, and the work we do currently with the Office of Reentry and some other uh, ideas that we have in terms of moving forward with working more closely with the Office of Reentry. So I'm going to start out just to give you some context and background. I'm not sure if there's ever been a really um, direct conversation about child support or its impact or, or the scope of what we do in Hamilton County. Uh, but the first slide talks a little bit about what the number of children that are impacted by the child support program. 37% uh, of children in Hamilton County uh, are in, involved in the child support program. Uh, and that represents about 71,000 kids uh, countywide. We have about 61,000 cases uh, on an ongoing basis in child support that our staff manage. Uh, and that's anywhere from, and that starts at uh, our location, uh, our uh, genetic testing process where we set, establish a case, also our ongoing enforcement of child support cases. So what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about uh, what our uh, objectives are and how we're measured by the state of Ohio in terms of our overall performance. Monica will talk a little bit about the engagement with our uh, Office of Reentry. One of the things I do want to point out, though, and this is not specific or unique just to child support, our division of child support, but also just agency-wide. Right now, we have a, a about 75, 77% staffed with child support technicians. Uh, so we're working again. We're, we're, I know we've talked about uh, where things stand as it relates to our negotiation with the union. So we're hoping, hopeful that that process uh, results in our ability to be more competitive going forward and to, and to increase the number of staff that we have. Uh, working uh, in that particular capacity, but also across the organization. All right, so first thing I kind of want to talk a little bit about is our uh, performance measurements in child support. Uh, these are federal performance measurements that uh, all county child, uh, child uh, enforcement agencies have. Uh, they're observed and monitored by the state as well. There are five areas of enforcement that we look at or performance that we look at. Uh, the first is the establishment of paternity. So when you think about uh, paternity establishment, genetic testing, uh, affidavits of paternity, uh, we are uh, responsible at a local level uh, for the establishment of paternity. And I'll get a little bit into the specifics of that in just a second, and all of these actually. Uh, the second one is the establishment of support orders. Uh, third is collection uh, of current child support, that is child support order to be paid in the current month uh, for children. Uh, and then finally, uh, collection of past due child support. Some of you may also uh, um, know that as arrears. And then the final uh, measure that we are uh, held accountable for are, is cost effectiveness. 
All right, so the first slide kind of talks about where we stand as it relates to paternity establishment. This measures the effectiveness of establishing paternity for children born out of wedlock. Uh, for, as you can see on the chart, we, we've remained steady in that particular performance area over the last several years. Uh, one of the challenges we face as it relates to establishment of paternity is location. So one of the primary responsibilities we have is that when we are aware of a child born out of wedlock, we get this information from hospitals. Uh, all counties receive information on children born out of wedlock. One of the first responsibilities we have is to uh, locate uh, the non-custodial parent or what we sometimes refer to as the absent parent. Uh, so back in 2018, uh, we were able to add some additional staff to address uh, our performance in this particular area. Uh, but we have a steady, we've been able to perform steadily uh, as it relates to the establishment of paternity over the last several years. And, and so I think we're uh, moving in the right direction as it relates to that. One of the other challenges, just to point out too, with respect to uh, establishing paternity is that Hamilton County is unique because we're a border uh, city and so some, sometimes we have uh, children that are born in our metropolitan hospitals that don't ne actually reside in our in our in our uh, county uh, that have a child here and they move to uh, another uh, municipality that is not within Hamilton County. The other measure that we are uh, accountable to is support orders, so establishing support orders. Once we uh, establish paternity, uh, the next phase of that is to establish a child support order. Uh, and so, uh, again, we've uh, been on a positive uh, performance incline uh, as it relates to establishing support orders. Again, back in 2018, we were able to add some additional staff that had an impact on our, our ability uh, to have uh, additional staff looking at and establishing support orders. The other thing too, just to clarify, as it relates to support orders, uh, we can establish support orders administratively. So we have uh, staff who can set support orders administratively before they go to court. Uh, and so we do a lot of that work as well at Job and Family Services. Uh, so we establish support orders there at JFS. Uh, and then there's some private filings where folks establish, uh, establish support orders directly with the court. The next measure that we are responsible for is a collection of current child support. Uh, and so uh, that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are held accountable for all of the orders that have been established and the amounts uh, that are due to be collected on child support. And uh, that number is compared to the actual number that we bring in and distribute uh, yearly, annually, monthly uh, for child support orders. Uh, right now, we, are, we stay hover around 65%. Uh, the state average is around 70%. Uh, as it relates to other metro counties, we are comparable with respect to other metro counties uh, in that particular area. Uh, and so we uh, continue to work to, to uh, try to improve performance in terms of collecting current child support. The other thing I kind of want to point out here too with respect to uh, collecting on uh, child support, and this will, we'll get into this a little bit with respect to our uh, arrears collections, is that uh, the arrears collection is slightly different. So the current child support collection measure is based on the actual dollars collected versus the dollars that are due. Uh, the arrears collection are based on the number of cases that we have. So uh, the way that's measured is that we, if we collect a dollar of, of back due child support, uh, we count that as a, um, uh, in our numerator as a collection on arrears. That's how the state holds us accountable. So it's not a financial measure, measurement, so to speak, more so uh, whether or not we're doing the work necessary to pursue back child support on a case, on a case basis uh, and not a financial basis. We've seen, and the, the camera kind of covers that up just a little bit, but there was a spike there you'll notice if you see on your presentation uh, in, in 2020 uh, as it relates to collection on arrears. Uh, arrears. Uh, and that had to do with the fact that at that time during the pandemic, uh, there was um, the payments that went out to individuals for pandemic assistance. The first CARES Act dollars were intercepted by the IRS and were applied to back due child support. So there was a spike uh, nationally actually in the, in the amount of child support collected uh, in, in that particular year. Uh, and we've seen that uh, come back to the uh, typical uh, number over the last couple of years as it relates to uh, uh, collection on child support arrears. The 
The other thing, the uh, last slide I'll kind of talk a, a little bit about is uh, what we do locally uh, in Hamilton County as it relates to arrears forgiveness. We've been doing this for quite some time. Uh, Non-custodial parents do have an opportunity locally uh, if they would like to uh, pursue forgiveness of arrears for, for uh, custodial parents, should I say, uh, if they'd like to pursue arrears forgiveness for uh, non-custodial parents, they can uh, come to our office. Uh, we have an interview with them. Uh, they fill out an affidavit, uh, affidavit uh, indicating that they would like to waive the arrears owed to them. Uh, uh, and, and we've done that over the last several years. The chart here kind of reflects the numbers of uh, citizens who have taken advantage of that. We don't enter into that lightly. Obviously, we look at coercion and a whole set of factors to make sure that uh, they are uh, making the decision that they are comfortable with uh, before we pursue arrears forgiveness. But we continue to offer that as an opportunity for uh, custodial parents to waive arrears that are uh, owed to them. So Monica is here today. Monica is going to talk a little bit more about our order modification process. Uh, and what we do for current child support orders. Uh, and this will also fall in more line with the work that we're doing with the Office of Reentry. A, a lot of times what will happen is that we will have obligors, what we refer to as obligors, trying to get out of that habit. It's really a non-custodial parent uh, who have an arrears uh, that they owe or current child support order that they owe. Uh, there might be a significant change in their income or their status. <clears throat> so we encourage uh, folks to apply for modifications uh, for, of their child support order to make sure that they are uh, right-sized and affordable for uh, them to pay. So I'll invite Monica up. She'll talk more about order modification and also uh, the work that we've been doing with pre-entry. So uh, as Michael said, we modify orders uh, administratively in, actually I'm going to go to that one first, um, in the agency. So that is initiated by either party can request an order modification through our agency. We run it through the worksheet, which is similar to kind of a tax return, and numbers pop out as to how much current support should be. So over the last years, you can see in 2018 and 2019, we had more modifications that we did those years. That is because there was a significant law change at that point. Um, in, in 2001 was the last time that child support had been looked at by the legislature. And in 2018 and 19, they finally looked at it again and said, we need to update those tables. And so that's when that happened. And that was the spike in those years. Um, since then, we've kind of leveled off. We do, you know, about 750 a year. You can do that administratively. You can also go straight to court for those. So this does not include any modifications that went to court. This is only through the agency. Um, so that those modifications uh, allow this, which is the current support due has decreased over the years because of those changes to the tables. So. Um, you know, an average support order years ago would have been, if, if both parties made minimum wage, about $250 for that child. In 2019, per month for that child. In 2019, when those numbers changed, that same order based on minimum wage for both parties went to $110 a month. So as minimum wage changes, those orders still change, and it's still changing. Um, when they changed the law, they also built in a provision whereby the legislature looks at those tables on a regular basis. That was never built into the law before. It is now. So it will fluctuate and move based on uh, the current uh, status of the economy, basically. Um, so that, that has resulted clearly in a downward change in um, our orders what we have to collect every month in current support. Um, this is, a, and Michael had talked about our metrics that were measured on by the federal government. One of them is cost effectiveness. So in Hamilton County, we are at the top in the state for this. We, for every $1 we spend in collecting support, we collect $10.50. So we really do a good job on this and we're really proud that we can do this. 
Cases in default, these would be cases that had fallen into default, meaning they missed payments, um, and so they now have an arrears. So as you can see in 2020, that went down significantly. Um, that has to do with, again, that uh, stimulus payment, that very first stimulus payment helped a lot. The other thing that helped a lot during the pandemic was the unemployment payments that were received. We received money on cases that we had never gotten money for. Um, so that helped. And then when those stopped, we're kind of at a, a different level here. I attribute a lot of that to, and I'm seeing it, I go to court on these cases, so I see them. We have kind of a new economy, and it's kind of a gig economy. So people are doing DoorDash and Uber and all of those things that they don't get a regular paycheck, and they're also not W-2 employees. So we can't have income withholdings. We can't, you know, they, they get paid at different ways. So it changes how that works. Before, when you would go to a temp agency and get a job, we could still do an income withholding. But these kind of positions and these kind of jobs, we don't have that. So I think we're going to have to change how we work to figure out how to, how to work in this new economy um, that, for lack of a better term, I kind of call a gig economy. You know, they're working these gigs or that gig. So um, that's what I attribute the new default kind of cases to. Um, so we have, um, in 2019, there was a significant law change. At that time, we were also able to, because um, I want to talk about the incarcerated individuals that we deal with. In 2019, we changed our process for modifications. Um, at that, prior to that, we, an individual that was incarcerated had to fill out a, a form and send it to us, which is a barrier in itself. That's really hard to do when you're in prison. I, I totally understand that. Um, but they would have to send us that form to request the modification. And then in response under the code, we had to send a form back to that, them called a financial affidavit that then they had to have notarized and send back to us. It, that sounds like a mountain to climb for somebody that's in the system. So. In 2019, we were able to say, we can confirm that you're incarcerated. You don't have to send the financial affidavit back. You still have to initiate the modification, but you don't have to show us that you're incarcerated. We can see that. So um, that was also one of the reasons that our modifications went up at that time, too. Um, so that was the first change that we made. And then recently, uh, we worked with the Office of Reentry and talked to them about how we could better support our re-entering citizens, our returning citizens. Um, one of the things that we've come up with is uh, we now have the re-entry court here in Hamilton County, which is, sounds like a wonderful, wonderful system. And, and Judge Wendy Cross is, is heading that up. She used to hear our child support cases, so I know that she has a really good idea of how this works. Um, so what we're going to do is with re-entry, um, we're setting up a system as a, a citizen starts in, in the program and starts to go into CRC and becomes incarcerated, we're going to start the program for reentry to help them get their order modified on the front end. Because it doesn't help to modify it on the back end. It only helps on the front end. So when they're going in, we've offered them um, an email where they can directly send that those forms to us so that we can modify those orders when they're going in, not when they're coming out. Because when they're coming out, we're then saying, well, you should be working. You know, and so that it it only makes sense to do it on the front end. So we've partnered with them with a, an email so that they can then uh, email us the forms and we can start that process for them immediately. Um, we are going to uh, also keep these cases in a specialized caseload so that we can stop some of our other enforcement processes. We can't stop all of them. The code requires that we do certain things and, and we can't just say, oh, we're not doing that. But we can, as long as they are in a program, which is the, the parameter under the law, they have to be in a program, which is why we're working with reentry court because they have check-ins and those kinds of things. So we can call that a program that they're in. They can we can stop uh, collection from their financial institutions. We can stop contempt proceedings. Um, and the bigger thing, which everyone hears about, we can give their license back. 
So we can give them their driver's license as long as they are participating in the program. Um, so we, we're working with the Office of Reentry and the Reentry Court so that we can do that for those people that are participating in that. And that would also be uh, with the, uh, I think that NKU River City program. We're doing the same thing with them so that they can also participate and have the same pauses in enforcement um, and the ability as they enter incarceration to get their orders modified. Um, everything that I'm saying about that though, if an obligee calls us and is adamant that we have to take an action, we'll really have to weigh that because it is owed to them. It's not owed to us. So it's a balancing act whenever we do these things because there are you know, other parties involved and so we really have to be careful about how far we push one side or the other. Um, and then we are still also, and I don't have a slide for it, but I am also working on this program because now we've, we've kind of built it with the drug court with uh, Judge Sanders as well. And she used to hear our cases over in juvenile court. So the drug court feels like a, a good way to do this as well. If they're in that program, we can also reinstate a license. We can start modifications. We can do all those things because we want these people to be successful. And we absolutely want these orders to be sized in a way that we can collect them. It doesn't make sense to have orders that are uncollectible. Um, so that's kind of our plan with reentry and the drug court. Any questions? First of all, let me thank you. I want to properly introduce you, uh, Monica Saylor. Thank you so much for the presentation. And um, we'll open it up for questions. I do want to highlight a couple things. Uh, I've always, and I tried to work with work on this at the legislature, I, and I want to find out from you, is this a federal law or a state law? The licenses. I just don't think that's the smartest thing. I mean, basically, you're telling a person, to they can't get to work and we want them to get to work and usually then they get pulled over suspended license now they're getting you know now they're incarcerated it just uh, you know i've always said that just doesn't make sense to me I, I think people should pay but to take their license and then a lot of the folks i love to see the numbers of folks who uh, lost their license because of behind in child support and were then arrested for having suspended license and now are in the court system. Um, I don't know if we have those numbers, but is that a state law or, I can't remember, I think it's a federal it's law. It's federal, yes, yeah, part of our federal uh, administrative enforcement techniques that the states and the counties uh, utilize in order to um, really get the attention of a non-custodial parent to help contact us to find out where things stand as it relates to uh, the court order and the obligation amount. And so we've gone uh, back and forth, I think at the state level too, with our associations and directors around uh, the license suspension uh, aspect of the law and whether or not it's uh, something that is prohibitive uh, and, or, or, or whether or not it works. And again, Monica mentioned this before, uh, we are in a unique position because we are managing and, and responsible for both sides, non-custodial parent and the custodial parent. And depending on who you ask, they may have a different uh, um, position on that. Uh, but we, we have used it, and what we found, uh, at least at the association level, is that it is probably, in terms of uh, effectiveness, one of, the, one of the more effective means of um, uh, helping us engage non-paying uh, non-custodial parents that so that we get to a point where we can have that conversation we can talk about uh, a plan for payment going forward uh, we can reinstate it relatively quickly after they contact us and we have either a wage withholding or an arrangement to pay or some other uh, mechanism to ensure that the payment is coming in on the order uh, as it's ordered uh, and so it's been relatively effective in that regard but also understand the opposite side of the of the picture, which is what you're referring to, Commissioner, which is uh, it seems counterintuitive to suspend a driver's license for uh, uh, folks that we are expecting to work and pay their child support. What I will say is that uh, in most cases, or in all cases really, uh, there have been multiple efforts on the part of our staff and our team to engage obligors and non-custodial parents who are uh, behind on their child support 
uh, before we take the action to suspend the driver's license. Uh, usually when they get back in touch with us after that, uh, we can, uh, we're pretty successful at arranging, having a payment arrangement so that they can meet the order going forward. Yeah, I get that. But once your license is suspended, when you when they call you and they make the arrangement, do they automatically get the license, or do they got to go back to the BMV? And they have they have fee? to go back to the BMV and they right. pay a twenty five dollar reinstatement fee. It's more than twenty five dollars. From what no, it's, it's twenty five dollars. That's it. That's it. Okay, it's twenty five dollar reinstatement people, fee. They end up paying. And I think the BMV is out of might be different suspension. Mm. Support suspension. Is so it's only twenty five bucks for child support suspensions. Correct. Okay, and then the other thing is, uh, do we have an amnesty program? We do. Every month in August is Child Support Awareness Month across the state. We, uh, we recognize Child Support Awareness Month. We have an amnesty program for uh, license suspensions that month. Uh, typically what happens is that you have to be three months behind on your child support before we can uh, suspend your driver's license. You have to pay that all back in order to get your driver's license back. Uh, typically in, in August, what we do is that we reduce that to a month. So uh, whatever you owe over a month's period, if we can get a wage withholding or a payment that satisfies a month of the month monthly obligation, we will reinstate your driver's license. That's not typically the case, but we also uh, work with the courts in August as well uh, on, in some months to try to expedite that process. But we get a promise to pay, uh, work with the obligor uh, to get the reinstatement for a month's of child support that is due for uh, for their order or however many orders they might have okay yeah i was at the courthouse and maybe at some other places i went over there uh, we had an, uh, an event and they had all these like posters up about child support but not the murderers they had i didn't see the murderers i saw child support people wanted and i'm not saying they shouldn't be wanted but i was like well what about these murderers out yeah. here that in our county is not the case in the building that we have uh, i know for a long time uh, that that was uh, sort of the most wanted poster uh, that that existed uh, historically uh, at, at Job and Family Services. Uh, we are pursuing a much more engaging, uh, supportive relationship because I think we can get a lot further if we're talking to folks, talking with them about the obligation, how they can uh, help support and meet that obligation, working with employers and, and our community partners to get them connected with employment so that they can meet the meet the obligation. So uh, that may be the case uh, in law enforcement, but in our building, uh, you know, we, we have moved away from the idea of, uh, you know, publicizing uh, that kind of uh, uh, poster for uh, child support obligors for some time now. I got you. And I just saw that when they got money, when they got the, the federal money, it went to pay. I'm not saying everybody's like that, but it went, you got the money and it went down. Mm -hmm. So it has to be that some of these folks are caught in the system that just don't have the money. And I'm not making any excuses because right. like you said, there are both sides where we tend to kind of tip one way and then we don't tip the other way. But uh, it showed on there at least when those stimulus dollars and those things, I don't know, it took them out of their check. But when they had a check to be taken out of, it seems like the child support, uh, the orders kind of went down, so that That's was correct. good to, to see. I'm going to turn this over to Vice President uh, Driehaus. Yeah, the only thing I was I was struck by many of those slides because of the volume of kids that are impacted by this issue. I'm I'm really struck by that. Um, but that said, uh, the the one slide that struck me was the one related to the economy and if the amount isn't withdrawn from the paycheck, then oftentimes it goes unpaid. And so I, I heard you say that you're working on a way to manage that, but I, I wonder if that line's going to continue to go up uh, because I don't feel like the economy is going to shift back anytime soon to um, you know where where we were a few years ago, and just you know what strategies are in place because from from my perspective, there are families, kids that are not receiving this re support, and um, if it is, it seems easiest and probably most efficient for that to be deducted out of a paycheck, right. um, you know, for, for both the person paying and the person getting the money. Um, how do you address that when the economy has seemed to have shifted away from that? Commissioner, that's a really good question. I mean, that is our preferred method. That is, I think, required if they have employment. That is, a, is. That is a legal requirement that if they, if they have employment that we use to wage, wage withholding uh, as, a, as a matter of the order. It's usually in the, in the order. Uh, to pay child support that it will be paid in that manner uh, if a job is available. So I think uh, you, you raise a good point. I think we are a lot more than any of the other divisions, obviously, 
impacted by the economy and the ability to pay. And so I do work with the OCDA. I know Monica is uh, continuing that work with the Ohio Child Support Directors Association to look at uh, uh, ability to pay. And so we, we use the child support calculations that are handed down to us by the federal government in terms of how we set child support orders. Uh, but we've done a lot of work over the last several years, I think at the state and the federal, at the state level at least, looking at the ability to pay and how we uh, can right size orders in a way that uh, will make it more likely that th those orders are being met month after month. And so we're not creating an arrears uh, that, it, quite frankly, for some non-custodial parents, $3,000 arrears might as well be $3 million. I mean, so, so our goal is to try to right size those up front by doing order modifications when we know circumstances change uh, to get ahead of that so that those arrears don't build uh, and go unpaid because the, the, the amount of, I don't have the number in front of me, but the amount of unpaid child support uh, across the country is extremely high. And so uh, every, every tool that we have in our, our, our toolbox to partner with uh, officer reentry, other providers that are engaged in uh, working with uh, non-custodial parents and know their circumstance, know their situation, can help us send the message to contact us, to work with us, to talk to us, to communicate with us so that we can be aware of the circumstance and work with them more directly to make sure that the order is uh, the, what it needs to be. Thank you. Commissioner Dumas. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for all your work you're doing in this area. Um, and just Monica, when you were talking about adjustment of um, the life situations and, and meeting them on the front end, I mean, that's just awesome. Uh, that you guys realized it was a, an issue. And so, um, Director Patton, I thank you, of course, for this presentation. And the drug court has been a godsend, I think, yes. to work with these people in their early, right when they're getting started. So I'm just really happy about that. And the driver's license issue, you said it's federal for child support. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, in these uh, villages and townships where they have Court. I know when I was judge um, for the mayor's court in Forest Park, they always said, uh, take your driver's license. It wasn't child support, but I stopped it right away when I was, and I told the prosecutor, we are not taking their driver's license because that just adds more desperation to the people that they were uh, removing those um, driver's license. So yeah, uh, I know you're looking at what you can do and adjust, but I know if it's a federal law, you have to do it. But um, they just need their driver's license so much. But all this information was just um, really helpful. And um, I just feel real positive about what you guys are doing to make sure both sides uh, get what they need. So I thank you so much for that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trina, did you have anything to add or? my support, but I also am very grateful. I'm mm -hmm. happy that we're having this conversation. Um, JFS has been an extremely awesome partner for us, especially for our clients. Um, it's whether it's the one stop being there to help with, you know, look at their job, um, child support modification opportunities, or just talking with people that are coming in our office, just asking about what can I do about my child support. Mm -hmm. And they're always there and ready to talk with them. So I truly appreciate that. Um, so thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you thank for what you, you do. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you guys. All right, um, that is the last thing on our agenda. If uh, we are in agreement, I'm going to um, entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Commissioner Summer Jimmis? Yes.